this? This is the ABQ Business Podcast with your host, Jason Rigby. Each week, we'll interview visionary business leaders to inspire the creative power and spirit that's in every entrepreneur. Discussing strengths, weaknesses, strategies, systems, and the problems we can all solve together for a new future for local small business. What is up, guys? Have an uh, amazing show today. I have Omar L. Harris. He hails from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He is uh, leads teams. He's a high-performance coach. He inspires the future leaders of today and tomorrow. He's a Gallup certified strength coach, best-selling and award-winning author, independent publishing guru, entrepreneur, and he's 20-year veteran of the global pharmaceutical industry. Not only ha- are we going to talk today about the Servant Leaders Manifesto, but he's wrote three other books, One Blood, From the Authors to Entrepreneurs, and Leaderboard, the DNA of High Performance Teams. And I always like to put it out there, and, and, and Omar, we're going to put it uh, out there at the end too, but your website is www.omarlharris.com. That's omarlharris.com. How are you doing today, Omar? I'm doing wonderful, Jason. Thank you very much for having me. I, I, I read your book and I thought, uh, and, and it's something that whenever you uh, read a new book and you open into something, especially leadership, because I, I, I could tell you, you're, you know, you just, you're like a, uh, you study it and, and all the references that you put in the back of book with John Maxwell, Stephen Covey, and all of those. And it just amazes me whenever you can dive into a book and, and you just learn so much newness, I guess. And, and I know you use a word called revolution, but in the very beginning of the book and in the afterward, you had three people that were very influential in your life and kind of shaped your life. And uh, one was a servant leader, an example to you. The other one had you, and you used the word like potentializing your talents. And then you had another person that gave you the relentless pursuit of excellence. Could you kind of go into a story about these three people? Definitely. So the, the servant leadership example was my father. Um, because of the way he served our family his entire life and my entire life and uh, the discipline and self-sacrifice and consistency with which he has, he's led the family. My father's a very humble guy. He's someone with very great determination, great consistency. So uh, he's been a, a living example for me my entire life. My mother was the second uh, second person that I acknowledge about to, um, who is somebody who really saw greatness in me from a young age and really told me that there really were no limits for me and uh, really put a lot into me in terms of my upbringing and, and making sure that I had the right opportunities to learn and to expand and really build on my, my natural talents. And then lastly, I was writing the book and uh, on January 29th, uh, we know what happened with, unfortunately, Kobe Bryant and his young daughter, Gianna, uh, who, who passed away in that tragic helicopter accident. And, you know, Kobe is basically the same age as myself. He's 42, I'm 43. And, and I was, I, I get to watch Kobe my entire life, basically, as somebody who overcame ex- extreme odds, you know, joining the NBA, a grown man's league at 18 years of age, and, and very quickly showing everyone that he was uh, for real and that he had, he, he had greater work, work ethic than people who had been in the league for 10, 15, 20 years. And, his respect for the game was something that I, I really took to heart. You know, he, he, he respected his craft uh, and, and that was something that inspired me. So I wanted to acknowledge his, uh, his influence on my life as well as I opened the book. No, I love that. And the Servant Leaders Manifesto, you kind of start off the book, and, and I like it because you kind of do go like right into the explanation of servant leadership. But before we get into that, you talk about an archaic leadership and then you talk about needing a revolution in leadership. And I want you to talk on Leadership 3.0, but could you explain to the listeners Leadership 1.0, Leadership 2.0, and then go into 3.0? Definitely. So really what I was reflecting on, the current state of leadership, and when you look at certain statistics like Gallup reporting that only 35% of people report being highly engaged at work, and to begin to ask yourself the question as to why might that be happening? Well, when you think about the history of, of how we got to where we are today, you begin to understand that although the demographics and the way work is being performed has evolved very rapidly. So now, even now post pandemic, it's even going even further with virtual teams and things of that nature. Leadership discipline and the, what's, what's the behaviors of leaders and their incentives have not really caught up with the way work is being done today. So I'll give the example of 
really post Civil War, early Industrial Revolution, when uh, mostly white men were coming from the farms into the factories, and they had most of them had a military background because of the Civil War or because of World War One conflicts. Utilizing a military hierarchy made sense, and having kind of these overseer supervisor roles and as people working on a repetitive task that were not complex with the assembly line, I think was the, was, was the way to go in terms of motivating high production. Remember that business leadership is all about how do I get the most productivity out of a given group of people in a given situation. So that really, really worked until the demographic of business began to shift. So in the 1930s, when World War II happened, you saw more women that came into the workforce as a necessity because the men were all fighting in, in the theater of war. And then, you know, Different things happened, immigration boom, civil rights movements. Now you have immigrants and you have uh, African Americans now uh, working in, uh, coming into the, the white collar workforce as well. And things began to change and more collaboration was beginning to be required. And so you couldn't just command and control your way to success. You had to get people to collaborate together. And that was when visionary leadership, leadership 2.0, was kind of born. And I use uh, John F. Kennedy and the space race as kind of a an example of an emblemic example of leadership 2.0. Then we continue through time, and the demographic of workers begins to become even more uh, more diverse. You have you know more generations working side by side. You have more uh, ethnic diversity, more racial diversity, more uh, uh, far more blending in terms of the sexes working together. You have different um, different uh, gender orientations, the sexual orientation working together. And leadership kind of paused at that visionary leadership stage, which was, okay, you have a great vision, have a strong leader who uses top-down command and control approach, and that's going to get the most out of people. What we begin, begin to see is that the way work is being done today with collaboration being the, the rule of the day, people working, you know, really flatter hierarchies, people working much more uh, heterogeneously across, across boundaries, matrix organizations. Now you're seeing that it's not enough to command and control people. That's not really inspiring and engaging uh, the workers of today, and it's not getting the most out of them. But unfortunately, the leadership is not caught up to this, despite the fact that every leadership luminary since 1990 has been saying the same thing around, you know, positive psychology, the need to, um, the need for collabor- collaboration in the high performance teams, building tr- uh, trust building behaviors, the need for, you know, humble yet willful leadership. So all of these big, great business books that I read when I was coming up through my career were saying the same thing, but I wasn't seeing any examples of that in the higher spheres of corporations that I was working for and that my friends were working for. And so it became clear that only a revolution, a dramatic break from the current pattern, will re-engage the global workforce and begin to recreate, uh, allow people to have to live their best lives again at work and to be more productive and be happy uh, with what they're doing with a third of their lives. The, the, yeah, that's amazing, and I think it's like when you get into the book and, and you uh, you explain it very thoroughly, the 1.0, the 2.0, and then the revolution with 3.0, why do you think servant leadership is the answer to this revolution? Well, I think servant leadership is, a, is, a, is, a, is an idea whose time has come. So basically, it's an old idea. Robert Greenleaf coined the term servant leadership back in 1965, right. but at that time, that, that leadership was not was not going to work in the in the current in that environment of visionary leadership. That was not going to work because it was all about the leader, the visionary, the visionary nature of the leader and their and their will and their ego, right? So Steve Jobs being a great archetype of that visionary leader who has intense ego and intense will and very very high standards, right? So we build a business out of those kind of attributes. Um, now, servant leadership is all about indiv- the individualization of leadership, not the one-size-fits-all approach. And because of the individualization that comes along with humility, will, and empathy, that is how you connect with people today, each individual on your team, understand the nature of the diversity, the unique talents you have in front of you, to the people and not the role, and then you can decide what you're going to do and what purpose you can achieve together. So of all the different forms of leadership, um, servant leadership is the most robust in terms of contemplating everything a manager or leader needs to have in their toolbox to really motivate high performance today. Yeah, and and you mentioned Robert Greenleaf. W- was there like a aha moment for you when you read his book? I know, I know you've read a lot of leadership books. What what was that when you first cracked open that book and and began to read it, or you got done with that book? What what came through 
for you on that to inspire you to, even to write your own book on servant leadership? Well, I think the fact that he was able to see that in 1965 right. in, a, in a completely different context. I mean, the the, the ability to, to to discern that this was going to be necessary. So he, he was a bit of a futurist, I believe. Right. And I, I think he could he could he could see where it was going. He he was already detecting the demographic shifts. He was already seeing the and, and think about it, the 60s were a very tumultuous time, right? Mm-hmm. So you had a lot of things going. I mean, not not unlike today's time, which were very tumultuous. So I think that you had a lot of division in the country, a lot of different ideas on how to get the most out of people, how to bring people together. And he was searching for that answer. And I think he found it uh, in service and not in ego. Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned the 1960s and you use a great example of servant leadership and leadership 3.0. And if you could share the story and how this was accomplished with Martin Luther King Jr. Yes. Yeah, so I think that Martin Luther King is a, is a, is a phenomenal example of leading with love, right? So he, he, he applied principles from some of the of his, which was Mahatma Gandhi when he went to, went to, went on his sojourn to India and he brought that philosophy that you could confront. Think about this. I mean, India was is a country of a billion people conquered by a nation, a very tiny nation, which is the British uh, Empire, right? And just to stand up to that might, the military might of the British, he did not use force. He used love. Mm. And so Martin Luther King saw that example and believed he could apply the same thing to the United States. But even more so, it was highly strategic because Martin Luther King also understood the trend of of, of TV and, you know, news and how people were consuming uh, information at the time. And he, he knew that if he created theater out of the protests and theater out of the, the bigotry that was happening at the time, that bigotry would trigger the national consciousness and people would not like what they saw and that they would, they would call for change. So he knew that he had to create allyship by showing the brutality that African-Americans were facing at that time in history. But he, he, he advocated for love. He advocated to love the enemy, turn the other cheek, and, um, to, and, and he inspired millions of people to take up nonviolent protests in a time when people were raging. People were, 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 I mean, very, very unhappy, but you didn't see any looting or any of those kind of, those kind of things at that time under his leadership. You just saw peaceful protests. You saw the other side, the, the antagonists. Um, really being their worst selves and that being broadcast for everyone to see on television. Yeah. And, and it, it created a revolution, like you said, and, and, you know, was the forerunner of leadership 3.0. How would you relate that to what's going on today with, you know, especially here in the United States with all the division? I see it, I see it the exact same way. Uh, although I think that we're not as, uh, we don't have the same, once again, we, we, we I was writing, I wrote an article about this just yesterday um, and it, it seems like we don't make leaders like those anymore, like the JFKs, right. like the Martin Luther Kings. Um, we don't make these kind of leaders anymore. People who who are who are courageous enough to wade into the fray and have a different message and not just uh, provoke our worst natures. It's very easy to be violent. It's very easy to to be triggered. Um, it's very easy to to be a Twitter tyrant. You know, it's, it's these things are, are easy to do. It's hard to lead with love. It's hard. To, to focus on the fact that there are commonalities on both sides of the aisle. There are things that bring us, to, there are more things that bring us together than separate us. And it takes a right kind of leader to be able to, to call on our better natures and bring us together. And that's what we need right now is, is a call for everyone to, to remember our better natures, remember that we're all in this together. I don't care if you're extreme right wing or extreme left wing, nobody wants to get COVID. No one wants their relatives to get COVID. Right. And whether you're uh, extreme right, left or extremely uh, uh, left wing, no, nobody wants to not have uh, their health care to, to, to go bankrupt because of because of lack of health care. And everybody wants the economy to be successful on either side. So we have we have these commonalities. We disagree on how to do it. But the how has never been a thing that divided America so much as it is happening right now. Mm, I love that. That, that it's, it's, I mean, just absolutely true words. And I, there's something that you, you used in your book, and I want you to kind of define it if you would, because this is where I began to pause and really think when I was reading it, um, is to define the word serve in servant leadership. Right. So the word serve in servant leadership is about purpose. It's about the mission. So it starts with a greater purpose, a purpose bigger than 
the individual, your individual goals. It's bigger than uh, even a corporate goal, which is to drive profits for stake for shareholders. It's about doing good in the world. So you're serving this higher purpose, right? This, this calling. And in order to serve the calling, you have to get the best out of people. So you have to serve the people, right? And how do you serve the people? Well, you serve them by help by setting up positive examples, by creating the conditions for success, by empowering people based with, with principles like positive psychology, and by focusing all of your work on removing barriers to progress that are in the way and preventing you from achieving your objectives as fast as possible. No. And, and you, you talked about a, a radical shift in attitude and that this is required for servant leadership. And that, that kind of seems kind of scary. If, if you're a typical, maybe a 2.0 leader and, and you're thinking of this and you're like, this just sounds, you know, it sounds amazing. This is something I really want to do. I've got pressure from above, you know, I, I've got to produce. And you use several examples of this uh, on the sales side of things. But whenever you look at this radical shift in attitude, what were you meaning when you used the word radical? Well, it's away from the self. So I think that, and I was having a conversation earlier today about the fact that um, we, we, We've gone into this cycle of, uh, as a people, of of uh, trying to, to achieve self goals faster and trying to this, this this celebrity thing, right? So you have the you know the advent of reality TV in the early '90s, and that led to the boom of what we see now: social media stars, TikTok stars, and everybody wanting to get their 15 minutes of fame as fast as possible. That also permeates business. Everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to be in charge. We have this whole culture of being the boss, right? I, I want to be a boss. And people are not understanding that, that there, is a, there is a tremendous responsibility when you are called to management and called into leadership. Gallup has a statistic, a, a statistic that 89% of the people who are chosen for managerial roles are the incorrect choice. Mm. Do you believe that? 89%. So that tells you either that the people who are applying for manager, managerial jobs don't have the right mindset or the selection process is off or both. Right. right? And that's what I mean by the radical shift away from, you know, I don't, you know, I never wanted to be a leader for my own uh, aggrandizement. It was never about me. I wanted to be a leader so I could expand my influence, so I could expand my positive influence on other people and get more done um, at a higher level and be more influential. That was what it was always about for me. It was never about, you know, the, uh, you know, seeing myself in the fancy office or with the perks or whatever it was. It was always about, you know, being able to have more control, hands on the control of the mission. That's yeah, what I always wanted. Yeah, and I always see it, especially on sell side, is you always see like the superstar salesperson ends up taking the right. manager position. And then, you know, as well as I do, you know, maybe they were, and you talk about this in the book, maybe they were extremely selfish. Um, maybe they shortcutted, never thought of the customer first. So now they're trying to learn leadership on the fly. And then they're trying to make these widgets of all these, you know, uh, of these little cookie cutter people like them. And so right, what, what loses right. in the end, they're getting a lot of deals done, but what loses in the end is um, the customer. The how matters. The how matters as much or more than the what. How you achieve a thing, how you achieve an objective is as important or more important than what is being achieved. Because there's a sustainable way and there's an unsustainable way. If I achieve a miraculous uh, goal, but I burn everyone out in the process. When we get, when it's time to go to the next goal, because business doesn't stop. When it's time to go to the next mountaintop, I don't have anybody with me because I burn everybody out, right? So it right. becomes that much harder to get to the next peak because I'm not I'm I'm losing people along the way. And that's what happens a lot of times is you can look at senior leaders and look at how many people have followed them. If you don't see followers for senior leaders, you know this is the person who is just looking out for number one the entire time. They're moving up to bigger and better challenges, but they're leaving a lot of people behind and a lot of bodies uh, are on the ground that are helping lift them up to their, their ultimate objectives, but no one else is being, is being developed and being made successful. Yeah, and, and shifting back to the book, whenever we look at this radical shift in attitude, you kind of give like, a, I, I don't know, it's kind of like a, a blueprint, and, and I know you call it a manifesto, but you use MHT, Mindset, Right. habits and tracking. And I, I kind of wanted to, if you don't mind, break down each of those three so that this, cause yep. you begin to kind of build and put these steps together where you can, where somebody can walk through the process of this. 
Well, if you want to be a servant leader, it starts with the self. It starts with how you, your own mindset. And what I mean by mindset is really the mindset that Stephen Covey talked about in the seven habits of highly, highly uh, effective people, which was around proactivity. So are you proactive or are you reactive? Are you somebody who focuses on what you can control and influence or are you someone who is concern-based? That's the first mindset. Are you, are you, do you have a bias towards action? Mm. And I think that's the, the key thing for servant leaders. Servant leaders are not passive people. They are action-oriented, get things done individuals. And they wake up every day with a mindset of how, you know, fo- but they're very, very, they're much more focused on what they can control and influence. A, a servant leader is not focused on what the CEO thinks of their work. They have very little influence over that, right? They're focused on really what they can control, which is their team and what their people below them and how they can lead those individuals. So they, 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 they focus on what's, what's, what's right in front of them. And it's kind of like a mindfulness uh, mentality as well, right? So being present in the moment, being ready now to serve, uh, serve your people. So that's the mindset that I'm talking about. Habits is, it's really hard to lead others when you can't lead yourself yes. from a habits perspective. So if you're unhealthy or you're, or you're anxious or you're unhappy in your regular life and you're not doing, if you don't have high performance habits like meditation, affirmation, regular exercise, regular reading, learning constantly, if you're not building yourself up, how can you stay ahead of the curve and lead others? Right, yes, you're gonna 100%. you're gonna stagnate. So if you have habits that are stagnated, then you're gonna stagnate, and ultimately someone's gonna pass you by. So servant leaders are also extremely curious, and they're also people who are really uh, want to want to want to digest as much information as possible, and they're always committed to self improvement because that inspires people. When you see someone, when you see someone on your team who's gonna run a triathlon or to do an Ironman, it inspires everybody else. Whether yes. you want to or not, people start running, people start doing more weights. Because this one individual is taking some control over the lives and shifting their habits, and it has a positively influential effect on everybody around them. So I think that's the kind of idea. Of, and then when it's a leader, it's even more powerful because the shadow of the leader is real. What, what you do and what you value is valued by, by others. So I think that habits is there. And then tracking is just the ability to hold yourself accountable. We all know, like we all set resolutions at the beginning of the year, uh, and we and when they're gone by the 20th of January, and the gyms are full in January and empty by March, and the servant leader uh, holds themselves with very very high accountability. What they say they will do, they will do. They don't make statements and then and then and then uh, uh, back down on those statements. So I think that those are three things. If you lead yourself this way, you have a proactive mindset, you have high performance habits, and you hold yourself accountable. You will be able to hold anyone else accountable, and that's the beginning of the journey. A servant leadership. No, I love that. And, and you use like this undercurrent or this word a lot in servant leadership. And I, I want you to get into this because <laughs> in the business world, this word is kind of taboo and that is humility. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's some, some, somehow it became a dirty word because I think that humility is uh, confused with passivity. Mm, right. Right. And I'm making a point throughout the book to say that servant leaders are not passive. They're not being nice. Humility is just a recognition of things that are bigger than yourself. It's a recognition that you don't have all the answers. How can you innovate if you have all the answers? There's no innovation when you have all the answers. It's only the pursuit of the answer that that leads to innovation, right? And so by being humble in the face of challenge and being humble uh, enough to recognize what you you know and what you don't know and to be humble enough to recognize that there's going to be barriers along the way that have to be moved out of the way, that's what we're talking about with humility. It's really just recognizing that this is not going to be easy and, and being uh, transparent enough to state that to the, to the group that guys, this, the journey we're about to go on is not going to be easy, but if we do stay together, we'll get there together. Yeah. And, and I, I think a lot of people look at humility and they don't understand the dichotomy of it, that you can be bold. And you use an example of, I think you were in, were you in Turkey or somewhere like that? Um, where you had to oh, go. Oh yeah, yeah. If you maybe you could share that with the the listeners because I think this is a perfect example of of showing humility, but then at the same time, you know, uh, getting to the point where you knew that you were serving these other people and, and that they had to to bring that level up. You had to. Um, I mean, you, you basically I mean, was it the CEO? Yeah. So so I, I use that as an example in the book of another another concept of of of, of authority versus power, right? But also humility is there because 
it's the humility to listen, to right. be listening to your stakeholders. So for me, you know, I was in tune with the sales force. I was in tune with the general managers in my region. I was working in the Middle East, North Africa, Commonwealth, of the independent states region out of Turkey, uh, 30 different countries with very different, very varying different uh, challenges. I was put on this project to, to, to determine whether, whether the company was going to invest in a new uh, customer relationship management system for the sales force because the one we had was clearly archaic. The CEO had publicly stated to shareholders that we would not be making such an investment uh, anytime in the near future. Yet I, I knew in talking to my stakeholders that it was absolutely necessary, especially because we were trying to make a digital transformation happen at the same time. And the platform we were running on was not going to be sufficient for us to get there. So I leveraged my humility to basically assume uh, uh, the role of project leader. So I said, listen, you know, I, I want to manage the project, not because it's about me, but because I believe that I have uh, the skill set necessary because I had worked in technology prior and I and also understood the pharmaceutical and the business side. I was, an, I was uniquely positioned to lead that project. So I, I humbly accepted the lead of that project. But what was key in the project was really my ability to influence without authority. So I didn't have, I mean, I was leading, I was working on a team with senior vice presidents and, you know, presidents of, 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 of the overall organization, having to convince them, making an argument that we needed to make a 35 to $40 million investment now on that technology. And, and uh, because of political issues, some of our stakeholders had gone to this, this president of, uh, who was working for the CEO and the president had basically put a kibosh on the whole project. I went to my sponsor and said, listen, we cannot let this project die. If we let this die, our company is going to die. So I, I asked her to do something very simply for me. I said, listen, just ask him for 90 minutes. It's not going to cost him more than 90 minutes. Ask him for 90 minutes so that we can make a proper presentation. He didn't make a knee-jerk reaction in five minutes, a five-minute hallway conversation, which is what had happened. And my sponsor asked for the 90 minutes. I prepared everything possible to make the argument. We submitted the presentation as a pre-read to the, to the senior executive. The meeting got canceled the morning of the meeting. I was like, oh, man, this project is over. And then my sponsor called me and said he read the presentation and approved the project spot on the spot. Mm, yeah, I, I, but I think that's a perfect example of balancing. Because like you said, I think so many leaders, because, you know, like leaders could be listening to this, you're using the word servant and humility, you know, and then not looking at it like th this boldness, you know, to step beyond and do more. Right, right. I mean, I think, I think that when you are in tune with the customer and where you're in tune with those who do, who, who represent the customer, who create value for the customer, those are the biggest boulders to move. It's not responding to your boss's individual whim. He woke up with an idea at five o'clock in the morning and he, went, he thinks this is a new sexy initiative. It's, it's better to be working on things that are gonna add value to the customer. And those things tend to be harder and tend to require much more, uh, much more sustainability and effort over long periods of time to get them done. But when they are done, they, they change the game. Yeah. And, and I, 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 when I was reading your book and I was going through, there was a bunch of quotes. I mean, you could, I, I was looking, I was like, oh, I love this one. I love this one. But one of my favorite ones is this transforming commitment into something tangible. That's a really powerful line. Yeah. When I wrote that, I was, I was basically saying that it's, it's, it, it is a force that you can wield commitment as a leader. It is, it is, it is just as tangible as, as uh, any other object, because once you have a group of people who are committed to a task, you can always call on that commitment to realign when things naturally occur, where, where groups begin to, to veer off into their own direction. And that commitment, that call to commitment, that agreement that you gain early on in the process, that holds everything back together. Once you have that commitment, you're holding, you're calling on people's integrity, basically. Right. And we all want to be seen as uh, as with people with high integrity. So, so if you remind me that I committed to something, it's very difficult for me to back out. And that's why, I mean, it's, it becomes tangible. Yeah. And I think you saw that in, in the story that you told us earlier with, you know, with everything that went on with the president and all that, that became tangible, that commitment that you made to say, I'm not going to let this die. You know, I know this is for the best uh, yeah. of the customer. Exactly. And so they were, I mean, I, I was going to go down fighting really was the point. And I had no authority. I had no power in this situation. I had, I had, I had zero power, but I had the authority that came from speaking with the voice of those who created value for the customer. 
Yeah, and and, and speaking of, of power, one of the things that you said, and and this this kind of, um, you know, I. I w- it was one of those things where it was like, okay, what is he meaning here? And and I think I understand what you're saying, but you said personal effectiveness is a reservoir. Yeah, so the MHC, the mindset, habits, and, and tracking. So you are building yourself up. So as a leader, you have to be your best self to provide your best self to people to help them live their best self, right? So you're building up. It's sort of like the, the concept of, if you read the book, uh, How Full Is Your Bucket? Right. You 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 remain full to the degree that you are giving to others, but you also have to refill your own bucket, your own your own stores, and you do that via the the mindset. And so, if, when you have a focused mindset, you're not letting concerns drain your energy. Right. When you have mm, yes. high performance, when, when you have high performance habits, you are constantly energized by what you're learning and what you're doing and your health and and the endorphins that come from working out. So you you feel good more of the time. And when you're holding yourself accountable, it means you're getting things done. The promises you make to yourself are getting done. So you have this reservoir of energy to bring your best self to the task at hand and stay committed, as you mentioned before, to those tasks. Because a lot of the time, the leader loses their their, their zeal for the task when it gets too hard. And then everyone else checks out. We've seen this happen all the time when someone says, I want to do this thing. And then for whatever reason, they lose their appetite for the actual journey ahead. Yeah, and and whenever I whenever I think of uh, managers, whenever I think of leaders, you said something, and I never, and I think servant leadership is you know putting yourself in not just your customer shoe, but also in those that you lead, those that you love, those yeah. that that, and and you said the manager is the company, and that's how those frontline employees are looking at you. Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, it, it occurred to me when I when I moved from a uh, an individual contributor role and became a business unit director, and I saw the weight of really my presence in front of my organization, my team. Right. I realized that I was the filter through which they were experiencing the organization. Mm. So I was, you know, however I interpreted my CEO's direction was what was going to get passed on to my team. So for example, if I was unhappy about a decision that was made from on high and I allowed that to project to my team, my team would be unhappy about the decision that was made on high, right? So I passed that right through to my organization. So they're seeing the company through my eyes. So I am the company to them. My displeasure has now been passed on to, you know, one person with displeasure has been passed on to 108 people's displeasure, right? Which is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a megaphone. Right. To be really careful of of your behaviors in the shadow of your of your you know the leadership shadow because people are watching you all the time and they are going to reflect the values that you reflect. Whatever you value is going to get valued by your people. That's mm-hmm. what I mean. No matter what's written on the walls of the company, no matter what whatever the purpose statement says, whatever the whatever the employee handbook says, what the manager values, what the manager rewards is what people are going to follow. They're not going to follow the handbook. They're going to follow the manager. And we've seen so many times when managers do bad things, people follow suit, and then everybody ends up getting blown up in the process. Yeah, and I, I've seen this before with, uh, with with leaders is, and and we've all experienced this ourselves. You know, is whenever you're doing something like that, like taking from the CEO, and 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 maybe you know he's uncomfortable with something, being passive aggressive with you, and then you pass it on, and then you're you're you know you're basically blaming. To me, it always seems like it's a uh, ego thing or being selfish in that moment as a servant leader, whenever you're, and, and, and you talk about this and, and I want you to kind of go into this in being an umbrella. Yes. So I think you have the responsibility to decide what gets through to your people. And what I mean by that is you're trying to keep people in a positive, productive and engaged state as much as possible. So you have to be very careful about the negativity you allow to pass through both ways. The negativity you pass forward and the negativity that goes down to right. your team. So for me, being an umbrella, imagine being an umbrella in a boulder storm, right? So basically those rocks bounce off the top of your umbrella. Uh, you might get a few lumps as a person holding the umbrella, but everybody underneath you is taken care of. No mm-hmm. one feels those, those lumps. That's the whole idea is that you take the lumps for your people. And you maybe you have to swallow some things that you don't like, but it doesn't mean how you interpret that to your team 
is always through a positive lens, right? And without being without being uh, um, lying, you can you can translate directions in a way that people will see the the benefit of of, of following that uh, forward. Yeah, and I, it's one word that you use that I think is is probably huge right now, especially with COVID and everything that's going on, is by being this umbrella, is that you're creating safety. Exactly, exactly. So I think that you you have to keep, you have an obligation. You're a steward, right? You're you're like a Sherpa leading, leading your team up Everest. Right. And the Sherpa's job is because they know the way, they show the way, they go the way, but they also make sure everybody stays together along the journey. And make sure everybody stays safe, right? So I think that that's really important. If you get to the top of the mountain and you lost half your group, once again, you're not a good Sherpa. Yes, right? so yeah, I think 100%. that it's really important that you you value the the safe space that you create uh, for your for your team because in that space, you, you, people are allowed to be vulnerable. People can disagree without being judged. Uh, people can commit. They can be they can be accountable and they can pursue their dreams in that. In that safe zone, they can do all those things uh, if you do it right as a leader. Yeah, and I love that example, Sherpa, because you know a billionaire could pay you know tens of thousands of dollars to climb Mount Everest. He's going to make it all about him. He's going to help take the picture at the end. Everything's going to be about um, you know that person and, and and not about themselves at all. But they're the experts. Without without a Sherpa, you're going to die. So I, I think that's exactly. a, a great example. And think about think about how many times Sherpas have climbed Everest mm-hmm. that we don't even count. They don't get counted. They literally don't get the amount of times <laughs> they ca- ca- climb Everest don't get counted in the record books. They do it all the time. Like it's not even a major accomplishment for them. I, I think they're amazed that they get so much money to do something they've been doing every day since they were born, right? So I think that that's the idea of it should be that natural to lead in this way. Mm-hmm. That it's not about you. It's not. It's never about you. It's about getting that individual group to the mountaintop, and then next year you have another group. And then I think that the sports teams, you understand that, like if the coaches, you know, professional sports coaches understand this idea of of being a Sherpa, right, and leading a group to that promised land, and then recalibrating and doing it again. And some people are better than others, but you think about like John Calipari of of, uh, of Kentucky and what he's been able to do with his talent, and you think about other people like that who 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 are who are good at. at uh, really, that cycle of leadership, continuously doing that job, uh, because the group is always different, and the challenge is always different. So being able to be flexible and adapt to e- each of those individuals, and and one of the things that you talked about is getting to know the individual so that they know that they can, that, that you, they actually truly, honestly believe that you care. Yeah, I think that, you know, so the other, the other dirty word of leadership is empathy, right? Right. Um, and, and servant leaders, they, they, they wield empathy, uh, very powerfully because they, because they've invested the, the right amount of time to understand the person before they get to getting the business, they can tune into that person's frequency whenever they need to and calibrate that frequency to make it as high performance as possible on a dime. Like I have the ability to look at one of my stakeholders and see they're having a bad day without them saying anything to me, bring them into my office recalibrate them, jazz them up and send them back out and, and, and get them back, back on the right track. And, and I think that having that, that making that investment is the most important thing you can do um, as, as leader of people, because people work for people. They don't work for, once again, you're the filter, right? So what they're going to experience the organization. And if your filter is humanized and is caring, then People don't want to leave caring environments. They don't want to leave people who care about them, right? right? So that leads to better talent retention. It leads to a whole host of positive outcomes for your organization. Yeah, and and I think another dirty word, if we if we're going to get into this, and, and I know in the book you you hit this pretty hard, um, which I loved, and um, it was trust, and and you said trust is the key. How do you instill as a leader, and you're looking at servant leadership? How do you instill trust? So I think you still trust by being being human first, being vulnerable, being open with your vulnerabilities, being open with your failures, being open with uh, your strengths and what you're what you're good at, and being open with your philosophy. I think that that openness and that transparency is key. You have to give trust to give trust. Mm-hmm. I also believe that trying to create an umbrella of empowerment is key to trust. So basically, letting people know, listen, 
I work, so when I, whenever I work with a new, new person, I let them know, and they may think that I'm just giving lip service, but I say, I work for you. I want you to understand that my mission in life is to get you where you want to get to. Mm. So we, we, we can always have conversations about personal ambition, what's going well, what's not going well. We can always talk about that. And I'm here to help you get to where you're trying to get to. And I'm here to help you have wildly wild achievement, great achievement. Um, but I need you to trust me as well in terms of, I need you to know who I am and what I'm about and how I got here. So I open myself up and tell my story and reveal my failures and reveal my successes and, and reveal my learnings more importantly, things that I've learned that can help them navigate the, the halls of corporations faster. And I do that as a coach now and I do it as a, an executive consultant. And, and when I did it, when I was leading organizations and enterprises, I did it every day with my team. So I think that that trust comes from you giving the trust, you being open and vulnerable um, with your people. Yeah. And I know with, uh, I know with trust uh, specifically uh, with my teams, I have trust, but then you went into something that really got me and, and it, it kind of just changed the whole way that I began to think of weakness. Cause it's like, okay, once you've established trust, cause you wouldn't want to get into this weakness paradigm until you have trust. But I was looking with my team and it was like, okay, I have the trust. I could do this. And you talked about, you know, defining weakness and using it with your team, weakness, fixing, you know, to talent, and then what the potential of the talent is. And then you used an example of a pin. And 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 that just like blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, uh, so I'm a Gallup certified strength coach. And one of the things we do in our workshops is just to illustrate why you don't want to fix weakness or why weakness fixing is not ideal. The exercise is, Basically, and you can do this on the call, listening to this right now. Um, pick up a pen, and I want you to write your name out with your with your off hand, your weaker hand, ten times. Now, think about how painful that is, and think about how long it takes you to write your name out ten times. And imagine if I were to give you give you a say. Listen, I'm I from now on, I only want you to write with your left hand. That's all I value is left hand penmanship. If you're right handed, right? So forget about everything you're good at. Now I'm developing your left hand. And eventually you might be, become decent, but you're never going to be as good. You can't take a calligraphy. You're never taking a calligraphy, calligraphy course with your left hand, your off hand. Right? <laughs> right, so, right. And, I get, I, and I get the example. Now write your, write your, write your name 10 times with your strong hand. And, and imagine that I take you to a development course for calligraphy, right? Using your strong hand. You have a much better chance of achieving that bar with, with, in an area you're already strong than coming from a baseline of weakness. And that's really... Uh, one of the key things that allows me to, to enhance trust as well, because people know that I, I am seeing what they're good at. I'm trying to put them in their strength zone as much as possible, and I don't spend time harping on what they're bad at, unless it's a derailing behavior that is something that it's not a, not a skill or capability, but more of a behavior that we need to calibrate their feedback. But any, other than that, it's all about how can I get you to do more of what you're great at? And people love to work with people who see them as being great. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, so, you know, like, like for me, I've established the trust and then it's kind of always, you know, and, and you get into this with a, uh, and we'll get into this here in a second, but uh, it, when you're, when you're, when you're looking at weaknesses, it's almost when you're coaching one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you kind of want to point out the weaknesses and okay, say you're a four in this, let's get you to a five or six where you're saying, um, take, if they're a seven or an eight in something, how can I get you to a nine or a 10? Yeah, I'm saying I'm going to focus on the seven or eight, uh, and I'm going to and and the, and the four or five. I'm going to say, listen, you know, you need to recognize where you are here, and don't let this become a derailer for you. Mm. So be aware of it. Be yes. highly aware of it. Don't let it derail your success because we're going to go to a ten with where you're actually good. And I don't want anybody pointing out this this area about you. So get good enough at it so no one talks about it. Yeah, that that's. But the... don't overinvest your time on developing it. I love that. And one of the things that you talked about, and I know you wrote a book on teams, but you were, you talked about finding the why behind top performers and then taking that information and cascading that knowledge to the rest of the team. And I, and you gave a personal story on there. Yeah. So I think that, uh, when you, when you have your, when you're trying to define the, the, when you, when you're doing your research of the people's strengths and what they're, what they're best at, right? So when you're understanding what they're good at, you begin to ask questions about their needs, their motivators, their beliefs, their their what makes them successful. 
because you're trying to understand the environments with which they become more successful when you're trying to understand what will what will create purpose for that individual right so how can you individualize your leadership style to create purpose for that individual and in my own career i i was lucky enough to work for leaders who personalized my work for me and they really changed my job description around what i was good at and helped me find purpose through that through that same way um and that was something very powerful for me in my career that led me to be very successful at an early age because I knew I had that that strong backing in terms of I was building, always building on what I was already good at. But also I was very clear on things that I had to work on from a derailleur perspective just to keep them in check. Omar, one of the things that was like something that I need to work on personally uh, with my teams is finding the why behind top performers and then cascading that knowledge to the rest of the team. And you gave a personal story on that. Yeah. So when I was working in Brazil, um, as, as a first time leader back in 2006, it was my first time leading, leading, leading people and also leading a team as a business unit director. I was still in the zone of leadership 2.0 examples of following Jack Welch's advice from straight from the gut, which was all about vitality curves and about kind of how you segment your performance into 20, 70, 10, 20% of your employees being the A stars, Bs being the majority of 70%, and Cs being the people that you need to really actively manage out of the organization so that you can bring in more A talents, right? So that that's the philosophy of the, of the vitality curve that GE uh, worked with for years. And it was a seductive kind of uh, philosophy, philosophy to me because it allowed you to make people improvements much faster when you didn't you know, carry dead weight uh, longer than you needed to. And that's a very American kind of approach to, to management was really carrying dead weight, the idea of that. Well, I, you know, so I did this for two years and we were very successful in Brazil and we tripled sales in two years. But then I had the opportunity to come back to Brazil in 2018. And when I came back in 2018, a lot of the people who worked for me in 2006 were still in the same position, the same jobs they'd been in when I was working for them in 2000. And six, and this is 12 years later, and I, I had an epiphany that if my leadership style was so effective, why were people in the same places? So mm. it taught me that perhaps I had not invested enough in developing people. I was so focused on the results and hitting the numbers that development fell to the wayside. And, you know, by all accounts, it was a massive success from a performance and from numbers, but from a people perspective, from a development perspective, I was very disappointed in myself because. The vitality curve misses the trick. Instead of you uh, promoting the A players and 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 just driving them to productivity results because they're working basically an A players were three B players, right? So that's as an example. Rather than that approach, what about understanding what the A players have learned about business or what the, what's making them successful? And then cascading that to everyone else in the organization. That's those same mindsets, those habits, and those how they're holding themselves accountable, and and cascading that. Then you have an organization where ninety to ninety five percent of your people are going to be successful. Imagine I could have probably quintupled sales mm, with that philosophy right. versus just tripling sales or doubling sales in two years. So I think that I saw it as a missed opportunity, and I could see that. In my own leadership, and people have been telling me for years, I'm such a great leader, but I, I didn't feel it when I came back to Brazil and saw that people were, by and large, in the same spot as they were when I when I left in 2008. And I, I, I thought that was a big wake-up call for me, and I wanted to highlight that um, as a key learning for me in the book. Yeah, no, I love that. And I, I want to ask you, you know, uh, okay, I, I've read the Servant Leaders Manifesto, I, I, I'm understanding servant leadership, but and I know you wrote another book with teamwork. But as a servant leader, how do you form a great team? So it really begins with what you value. So I, I talk a lot about values and what the what what's get, what gets valued is what gets done, and this can tra- uh, translate into all into what you're valuing when you're hiring people. So how do you construct a great team? Well, you have to look at the attributes you're valuing in a new hire. So do you value pedigree? Do you value the prestige of the name of the company the person worked with before, uh, or the name of the university they came from, or the community they came from, or do you value things that are much more beneficial to teamwork, such as work ethic, shared passion, solution orientation, and maturity? Mm. And so I advocate for a process called the whom 
which is work ethic, heart, optimism, and maturity, which are the four things that if I have those building blocks in place and everyone on my team, we're already off to the races when it comes to, uh, to high performance because we're all going to work hard. We have shared passion. We see opportunities and problems and we're mature enough to overcome inevitable disputes that are going to, that are going to happen along the way about the direction or what's happening in interpersonal relationships, which always happens in any group. So when you have those four things as a foundation, those attributes as a foundation, your, your, your speed to creating a high performance organization triples or quadruples. No, I love that. And we're coming up on the hour. So I want to get, you know, two or three more questions. And if that's fine, Omar, I want to kind of shift the side to the customer. And you said something I think that was profound. You said the customer is eternal. Yes. So imagine that if you were a Ford customer and imagine that a Ford was, did a great job in terms of fostering customer loyalty from generation to generation to generation. Well, then you've been buying cars from Ford since, 19, since 1918 in the Model T, right? Mm, right. And, and so um, we tend to see customers in the short lens of what, we're gonna, what, they're, what they're buying this quarter from us, what they're buying this year. But if you're trying to, you know, business is eternal. Business is, is an infinite game, as Simon Sinek said. There's no winning this game. The, the goal of the game is to perpetuate the game. So if you think about it from that lens, the question is, how can I be adding value to three generations down of this family um, 100 years from now? How can I always be adding value? And that's how you stay in business. That's how you jump the curve. That's how you make sure you are constantly innovating and staying ahead of the trends and, and understanding what's going on. So I think that that's what I mean by the customer is eternal. Um, they're always going to be there, and but they're not always going to be with you, depending on how you proceed. No, I love that. And I want, I want to wrap this up with the the biggest four letter word i think in leadership mm-hmm. and you mentioned this at the end <laughs> and that is l o v e love why is it why For do you sure. think it's so removed from leadership well i think that especially in the us with all of our regulations and rules i mean i've worked overseas and for example in brazil when you interview somebody you it's important for you to ask them about their personal life and their professional life here in the us you can't ask those questions because of it can create bias. It can lead to people not being hired, right? But for me, knowing more about someone's life uh, allows you to fall in love with that person and help. And when you love someone, you want the best for them. So it's not about yes. your ego. What happens when you love a child, right? Your love for them is egoless. You'll do anything right. to help them succeed. If you have children, you'll do anything to see your children do well in life. And so that's what I mean by love is, you know, you have to love to lead. And loving to lead means you love seeing people succeed, seeing other people succeed. You get off on other success, more than your own success. Because you're good. You're, you, you're, you're well-stocked in the reservoir. You have a, well, you have a well-stocked reservoir of, of, of uh, positivity because of the way that you operate. So you don't need these little ego boosts, but your people do. They mm, need that right. reward and recognition. They need that from you. And so that's what I mean by, by, by love, is basically removing the ego and treating these people like family and helping them like you would help someone that you really, really love to achieve what they want to get done. And I think that's the ultimate aspiration of servant leadership is that you look at a group of people and say, you know, I love this team. I love these people. And what we are going to accomplish together is going to be written in the history books and sung about by troubadours and 50 years from now, right? Like it's that kind of feeling, that vibe. That you that, that's when you know you're in the sweet spot of servant leadership. When you love them, they love you. And it's not about being nice because they, lo- they don't love you because you're you're so nice. They love you because your your intention and your action shows them that you are trying to help them be the best version of themselves. No, I love that. That that is that is amazing. Well, Omar, I know people can go to your website, www.omarlharris. That's O M A R L H A R R I S dot com. I encourage everybody to go to um, Amazon and you can um, I know it's on Kindle version. You can download the books. Uh, is there are you on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn? What, what are you most active um, on? Yeah. I'm on very active on LinkedIn. So uh, my LinkedIn is just my name, Omar L. Harris. You'll, you'll, you'll find me there. I'm, I'm very active. Uh, if you want daily inspiration, Twitter is there. So Strength Leader is my handle on, on Twitter. 
And um, if you want to see, follow and see what I'm doing, it's more Instagram. So Omar L. Harris on Instagram is how you find me. And, and, and we can, you know, follow along and work together. Once again, I do executive coaching. I do individual coaching. Um, I do team and organizational consulting. So if I can help you as an individual or your organization, um, uh, then please call on me. I'd love to, love to stay connected. No, I think that would I think that would be great. And like I said, your website is omarlharris.com. Omar, last thing, and, and maybe you can end on this if that's fine. The most convicting quote out of your book that really hit me, and it's at the end, and I've been thinking about it for the last few days, is your people deserve better. Yes, and I think that was really the, the clarion call to action that made me want to write the book was that one thing that I mentioned earlier, we spend a third of our lives at work. 35% of people are, 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 are stating that they're highly engaged at work, which means that 65% of people are not. Uh, we're ruining people's lives with management and we're ruining people's lives with work, the way work is being done today. So the people deserve better. We've got to give them better. And you're the person who has to do it. Each of you listening on this call, that's your responsibility as a leader. It's not about you. It's about them. And the more you make it about them, the more you will be successful. I love that. Well, thanks, Omar. I appreciate it. I, I wish everyone to go to Amazon, go to your website if they need coaching or if, if they're going to purchase a book. Do you have another book that's going to be coming out um, anytime soon? Yeah. You got something in your mind? Yeah. I do. I'm working on it right now. I'm almost finished. So uh, I have a book that's probably going to launch in February or March of next year called Be a Jedi Leader, Not a Boss. Mm, I love that. That's, that's going to be awesome. Well, thank you, Omar. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Jason. Take care. Have a good evening. Thank you for joining us on the Albuquerque Business Podcast. And thanks to our sponsor, RigbyDigital.com. Make sure to subscribe and share. And go to ABQPodcast.com. Get show notes, resources, and links to everything we talked about today to help you navigate your journey as an entrepreneur and business owner.